Welcome back, everybody. Uh, in part four of chapter eight, what we're going to do is we're going to look at precipitation a little bit closer. Some things dissolve in water. Some things don't dissolve in water. Some things that really should, according to our rules, um, their ions or whatever, and they don't dissolve. And so how do you figure out what is going to dissolve or not dissolve? That is the question. Okay, so when we have ionic compounds, some are soluble, that is, they dissolve in water, and some are insoluble, that is, they do not dissolve in water. So what's going on? Well, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, when we, and this is what a precipitate looks like, okay? It's solids in the bottom, basically. Um, if you have a solid silver nitrate and you put it in water, it will dissolve and form a strong electrolyte, like we would imagine, okay? That should be A, G, or N, O, 3. That's a book thing, not me. Um, but when you put silver chloride in there, it doesn't dissolve. I mean, like nothing. You're not seeing anything. And so it stays as a solid. It will not, you can mix it, and stir it, whatever you want to do, but it is not going to um, disappear. It is going to stay as a solid in there. And so it is considered to be insoluble. So what's the difference? Well, there's there's several ways that you can do this. One way we look at in Chem 2, it's called a Q-test, uh, not Q-tip, but Q-test. But in here, we look at a chart. We have some rules, and it tells us which things will and which things won't. Remember, though, the basic reason that it will or it won't is because you have interactions between solute molecules and if those are stronger than the interactions between the solute and the solvent then they're not going to dissolve so how strong those interactions are is what is what really makes the difference so we look we have some solubility rules that we use in chem 1 to help us so the first rule is that for the positive ions, anything with lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, they're going to be soluble. Okay? Everything. Everything that has nitrate or acetate, they're going to be soluble. period. Okay, so if you see that in a formula, you know that's going to be soluble. Then you have your halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. They mostly are soluble unless they're paired with silver, mercury, or lead, which are heavy metals. Okay, not the music. Sulfate is also typically going to be soluble unless it is with strontium, barium, lead, silver, or calcium. Okay, so what you do is you look and you see, oh, I see sulfate in there. It may be soluble, but you look to see if it's tied up with strontium or one of the other exceptions. So this is the soluble part of the table. This is the insoluble part of the table. So hydroxides and sulfides are almost always insoluble unless they are with sodium, lithium, potassium, and, and ammonium, which we know is always, right? Um, it could also be soluble if it's with calcium, strontium, or barium. So it's really weird because um, Strontium and barium with sulfates make them insoluble, but with a sulfide, it makes it soluble. Go figure. Okay. Um, and hydroxides are typically um, 
somewhat soluble anyway with calcium, strontium, and barium. Um, carbonates and phosphates are typically insoluble unless they are with these that are always soluble, the lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. So you, you, you have this chart, you look at it, and you decide if something is going to be soluble or not soluble. Why is this important? Because we're leading up to looking at precipitation reactions. And by definition, a precipitation reaction is where you put two liquids together and you form a solid. And so the reason you form a solid is because the resulting product is insoluble in water. So this is just where you look at the table and you decide, um, is it soluble or not soluble, okay? Lead and chloride. Is lead, lead is almost always what? Insoluble. Copper chloride, chlorides are always soluble except with those few exceptions. So this one would be soluble. And you can go and you can look at my logic on that chart we just marked up. Nitrates are always soluble. Always, always, always. Sulfates are usually insoluble unless they're with one of the exceptions and barium is not. Okay, so they are insoluble. So this is all you're doing. You're going and you're looking at the chart and saying, okay, if I put these two things together, will they form a soluble or an insoluble compound? And so here are some for you to look at and look at the chart and kind of get some practice doing that. So what I, as I said, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to be able to predict if something is going to form a precipitate or an insoluble product when we react to aqueous, water-soluble solutions of ionic compounds together. So great, great dynamic example of this is potassium iodide and lead nitrate. They're both soluble. They're both liquids. Okay, they're clear. When you add them together, you form an insoluble product called lead iodide. Okay, and then potassium nitrate, which stays in solution. And so since the lead iodide is what is insoluble, okay, then that is the precipitate. And it forms this really cool, cloudy-looking, fluffy, yellow precipitate, which is lead 2 iodide. The potassium nitrate still hanging out. You got potassiums and nitrates still hanging out in solution. But the lead, notice, the lead is not soluble. So these lead, the potassium and nitrates are going to be soluble, but the lead ain't going anywhere because it's got a very, very strong intermolecular attraction between those molecules, those other atoms, I should say, of lead. So when you're predicting precipitation reactions, the first thing you do is you have to determine what ions each one of them has. Then you figure out the formulas of the products. Usually this involves switching them, okay? You know that positives and negatives are the only things that can go together in ionic compounds. So you take the positive of one that was with a negative and you put it with the uh, negative of the other reactant, okay? And so by doing that, you just kind of switch them so that the cations and the anions switch up. It's kind of like square dancing a little bit. So how, you know, how do ho right? You determine the solubility of each one by looking at the rules, and then you can tell is it a precipitate reaction or not, because if it doesn't form a solid, it's not a precipitate. If neither one precipitates, it's no reaction because you're testing it for precipitation. So if you don't get a solid, it's no reaction. If products are insoluble, you write the S beside them. That tells me which one is a solid. Everything else is water soluble, which we call aqueous, which is a Q. Then you balance the equation only changing the coefficients. That's why you do the formula first, because you can't change the formula, only the coefficients when you balance. 
So let's look at an example, 8.6, writing equations for precipitation reactions. So we're going to write an equation for the precipitation that occurs, if any, because it could be no reaction, when you mix solutions of potassium carbonate and nickel 2 chloride. All right, so when I, when I start this off, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to figure out, I've got to go back and remember how to put the formulas together, right? So I've got potassium carbonate. And I'm not going to worry about the actual formula. I'm just getting the elements out first. And I'm going to add that to nickel 2 chloride, okay? So that one's an easy one. I know that um, chloride, chloride is always a minus 1. And it's telling me right here that that's a plus 2 nickel. So I know the formula will be NiCl2, if you recall from how we put these things together. Because it takes two of the negative ones to compensate for the plus one. All right. And then I do the same thing over here. Potassium is usually a plus one. And if you look on your polyatomic list, if you can't remember, carbonates are minus two. So you can swap and drop. Right. And so you're going to have one carbonate and two potassium carbonates. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite this. So, all right, so K2CO3 plus NiCl2. Okay, so, and these are soluble. So, you, whenever you're putting this stuff together, it's soluble. So, they're both aqueous. All right, and so I put those two things together, and I'm going to see if they form an insoluble solid. All right, so remember, I'm going to swap. So this one's positive, and this one's positive, so I can't put them together. So I'm going to put the K with the CL. See how I did that? I just swapped the, so now the positive of the original one is with the negative of the other one. And then nickel carbonate. All right, I know this is a plus two. That's a minus two, so that's how they go. This is a plus one. This is a minus one. That's how they go. All right. So I have put them together. Now I'm going to look at my chart and try to decide if some, if, if either of those is soluble, if insoluble. So I look at potassium. Okay, so look, remember potassium, anything it's with is always soluble. So this one's going to be soluble, which means it'll be aqueous. Then I look at nickel carbonate. Well, nickel's not really one it talks about much. So I'm going to go down here, and this, remember, is the insoluble part of it. It says carbonates are almost always insoluble unless they are with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. So that means if it's tied to nickel, it must be a solid. So it is going to be insoluble, and so that is my precipitate. So then I just balance it, and these are super easy to balance. I'll just tell you, you got two potassiums over here, so I'm just going to put that right there. And then I got one nickel, two chlorines. I'm, I'm balanced. See how easy that was? Most of them, it, you put one number, maybe two numbers, and you're balanced. So it's not even really a hard thing with these, with these reactions because we just swapped them. With me? So this is the answer right here. So this is your balanced precipitation equation um, between potassium carbonate and nickel 2 chloride. So we're taking all of the skills we learned and we they see how they've built and now we're actually doing chemistry. And here is your practice. Okay, so in this one, in example 8.7, I'm going to add sodium nitrate and lithium sulfate together. So sodium nitrate plus lithium sulfate. Okay, nitrate's a minus one, sodium's a plus one, so they're good to go. Sulfate's a minus two, lithium is a plus one. So I'm going to swap and drop. So I'm going to have one sulfate and two lithiums. What will be the compounds they make? They're going to swap. 
So I'm going to have sodium sulfate plus lithium nitrate, right? Plus 1 minus 2, so sodium Na2SO4 plus 1 minus 1, so that one's good. I know these two are aqueous because that's what I'm, I'm putting two aqueous solutions together, okay? Then when I look at my chart, I'm going to see that I have a sodium attached to something and a lithium attached to something, and those are my always soluble rules. So those are both aqueous. So since my products are all aqueous, that means I didn't form a solid. That means I didn't precipitate anything. So this one is no reaction because it's not a precipitate reaction because everything just kind of hangs out and swaps around. Okay, so you can have them that aren't reactions, that aren't precipitation reactions if everything stays soluble. Okay, so here's some more. That's why we always say the reaction that occurs, if any, when you mix things together. Okay, so that is how you predict your, your products and predict whether it's going to be a precipitate that is insoluble solid or not.